Well, welcome to the second session of Stanford's European Entrepreneurship and Innovation. My name is Burton Lee, the course instructor. Today we're going to be focusing on the Czech Republic and Slovakia with uh, our three speakers, Andrei Kiska, Barbara Pivniska, and Pavel Serbajo. We're very happy to have Andrei Kiska to come here from Prague, although he's based in Menlo Park now, representing Credo Ventures. Andre, thank you for telling us what's going on with Credo, a little bit of the history and what's happening on the uh, Czech and Slovak uh, tech and startup ecosystem. So sure. let's give Andre a hand. Great. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. It's an honor to be here today. Uh, my name suffers from the same deficiency as Orloj, the astronomical clock. It also ends with the confusing J. So it's not Andre, it's just Andre uh, pretended the J is silent. So I'm a general partner at uh, Credo Ventures, um, and I wanted to, oh yeah, it's down here. And I wanted to uh, start by telling you a little bit about my personal story, uh, a little bit about development of Credo Ventures and the reason why. Ah, it's working. And the reason why, um, I think I can tell you a little bit about the Central European startup ecosystem, in particular the Czech and Slovak one. So I studied at the University of Virginia, uh, and when I graduated, I wanted to be somewhere closer to home in Central Europe. Um, I was deciding whether to end up in Bratislava or Prague. You know, my mom said that if I come to Bratislava, I should live with her uh, because that's where she lives. So as much as I love my mom, uh, I moved to Prague um, and started my business there. Uh, and I joined a, a growth fund uh, which invested in a company called AVG Technologies. Uh, in 2003, they had about $3 million in revenue. And by 2011, they were set to IPO at the New York Stock Exchange with $330 million in revenue. It was the only company from the Czech Republic to ever IPO at New York Stock Exchange. And I was thinking, well, if one company out of Brno, Czech Republic, can do it, why couldn't more companies do it? And that's when uh, actually two guys, the original founders of Credo Ventures, came to us uh, looking for funding for what was then the first institutional seed and Series A investor in Central Europe. Uh, and that's how Credo Ventures got started. Uh, so it was the four partners uh, with 18 million euro fund uh, set on a mission to invest in eight countries in which all of them we saw a similar market opportunity. There was no seed and series A investor investing solely in technology companies out of that region uh, with global ambition and uh, global potential. Uh, since then, we have raised another fund, uh, which was 53 million euros, so we now manage about 70 million euros. And believe it or not, they make us the oldest and largest seed and series A investor in Central Europe. Uh, so that gives you an idea about the size of the ecosystem, and at, at, at least as of right now. Uh, so we have made currently about 40 investments, six exits, and the countries that we invest in are Poland, you can see it on the map there, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Croatia, uh, Slovenia, Romania, and Bulgaria. Uh, now, as you can tell from Burton's presentation, he loves pictures. So this morning he sent me feedback on my presentation, he's like, you have no pictures, no people, no city, so include some pictures. So I thought that I would share a picture of Prague with you, uh, primarily because you know, we invest in eight countries, but all of us, well, besides me now, uh, are based in Prague. And I guess the reason for that, and if you guys ever are considering either visiting Central Europe or living in its part, I would strongly recommend Prague, uh, just because it's consistently, consistently voted as one of the top 10 cities to live in. And we call it sort of a Western city for uh, Eastern prices. Uh, so there is uh, a lot to see and it's a good bank for your buck, as you guys like to say. Uh, now, uh, briefly about my team, as I mentioned, it's four general partners. Uh, the two founding partners are Andre and Jan, uh, the two who approached us uh, with the growth fund to seek money. Uh, I actually joined as just a junior member of staff in 2010-11 and uh, I was promoted to partner in 2015. And our fourth partner is Vlado, uh, who joined us uh, in 2011 as well. Uh, all of us based in Prague, with my exception, I uh, relocated to Menlo Park in August last year to open our office here. And by office, I mean my computer and my desk next to my bed in my house in Menlo Park, uh, where I currently conduct our business. And sort of the goal of why we did that is, well, essentially, we are telling our entrepreneurs for a decade that if they want to build a global business, uh, they should at some point relocate or have significant presence in Silicon Valley, which is still uh, the mecca of global startups. 
you know, after giving that advice to our entrepreneurs for a decade, we finally figured that we could follow our own advice and make the relocation ourselves, uh, which is the reason why I'm here today. Uh, and my mission is threefold. I support our portfolio companies that are here already. Um, I am scouting what the Central Europeans here are up to, um, either for recruitment purposes or investment purposes. We can invest in any company that originates out of Central Europe or strongly benefits from the region. Um, and the third reason is just networking with potential follow-on investors about investing in uh, our current portfolio. So that's briefly about our team. And as I mentioned, uh, you know, we invest in Central Europe, so I wanted to briefly at least show you the map uh, of, our, uh, of our region and where we invest. So uh, there are a lot of companies concentrated in Czech Republic, Poland, and Slovakia, which we find are, hey, well, A, that's where we are based, so it's just easier. Uh, but B, also Czech Republic happens to be one of the more sophisticated ecosystems out of those eight. Uh, uh, the few of the exits that we had, one was to Oracle, one was to Cisco, one was to Custom Inc. Uh, also a couple of interesting fundraising rounds, for example, the UiPath one. It's a Romanian company which remains one of the largest Series A investments in software companies in all of Europe. Uh, so it seems like uh, Central European uh, startups are on a good path. And that's what we are going to talk about primarily today. So the presentation is divided into two sections. Um, we'll start with sort of a little bit of a historical context and uh, a history of entrepreneurship in our, in our country. Then I'm, compared, I'm going to compare the Czechs and Slovaks, which is always a tricky thing, right? Like we used to be the same country, and now we are different, so there is a little bit of rivalry. And you know, we are the smaller ones, so we always have the insecurity symptom and we are trying to be better than the Czechs, so I love to compare the Czechs to Slovaks. It will also show you some success stories from the region. Uh, then we are going to segue into some of the challenges we are facing uh, and what are the biggest bottlenecks to our development. And last, we are going to look at uh, the funding ecosystem and how cash and investors can help, help overcome the challenges. So the historical context. Well, one of the first things you should know if you are uh, considering visiting the Czech Republic is that the Czechs are the biggest beer drinkers per capita in the world, and I think the sixth biggest hard liquor drinkers per capita in the world, which just makes them very heavy drinkers. Uh, so therefore, you will probably be not surprised that one of the inventions that came out of the Czech Republic is a drunk tank or a sobering up station, uh, whose station is basically to take care of the drunk people. And just to you know, highlight the significance of this invention, um, over 1.2 million people were treated by a drunk tank in Czech Republic and Slovakia. And mind you, that's more than 10% of the population from back in the day. Uh, the shutdown of similar stations in Poland actually caused uh, major outrest and overflow of patients in hospital ERs because there was nowhere to treat the people. Uh, another very productive invention came from Nikola Tesla. Uh, you know, this might sound pretty relevant to you guys based here, but we have no earthquakes in Central Europe. So Nikola Tesla decided that you know, we want it to be closer to Silicon Valley, so we are going to invent our own earthquake machine uh, so we can simulate how you guys feel here. Uh, and, you know, so, I don't know, aside from, you know, the empathy for you guys here, I guess the only reason why he invented this to, you know, uh, make his building fall apart, uh, which I think he eventually did not succeed in. Besides those, we actually have some serious inventions that came out of the region uh, over the past couple of centuries. Just a couple of examples. We have the lightning rod, the ship propeller, contact lenses. We are one of probably 10 regions in the world that say that radio came from our countries. And we have Nikola Tesla. Uh, it's not the guy who invented the electric mobile Tesla. Uh, it's another guy from back in the day with over 300 patents that, for example, invented X-ray or alternating current. So, so much about our inventions. And if we are to fast forward to today, I very much slimmed it down into our investors in uh, uh, software com or inventors in software companies today. And basically, uh, you know, we actually have a representative of this company here with us today. Uh, HackerRank is a great company. I strongly recommend it to all the companies. You know, I get a small success fee from him every time I say it. Uh, but uh, it, it's a company that what they do is they have about 3 million developers on their platform. And, uh, you know, if you are a recruiter and you are looking to have some technical exams or coding challenges for your candidates, you contact HackerRanks, who is going to uh, examine uh, your potential employees to scan which ones are good and which ones are not. And the interesting, interesting thing about the data they have is because they have 3 million developers taking exams, they have a pretty good idea of how good the developers in different countries are. So if you take a, a good look at the table, and I'm not sure how well you can read it, pretty well. 
First is China, that's not a shocker. Then you have Russia and Poland. Then you also have Hungary, Czech Republic, Ukraine, Bulgaria. So basically all of our countries from our region are in the top 10 or 12 countries um, as the best developers in the world. Uh, Switzerland, that's a bit of an outlier. I feel like all the retired uh, coders from Eastern Europe moved to Switzerland for better lifestyle. Uh, then a couple of Asian countries, that's probably well deserved. And then France, I don't know, they probably sponsored that year's survey. I'm not really sure about that one. <laughs> they have a lot of money to go to startups this year. Uh, but the rest of them are primarily company, uh, primarily developers from our region. So the strongest underlying asset of Central European startup community is just the sheer strength of the technical talent that comes out of there. That's sort of the, the key takeaway of where we are today in terms of inventors, let's call them. Uh, Andre, can you explain why the United States is <clears throat> Well, I can't. You should be asking that yourselves, right? I mean, it's a, it's a good question, but, uh, you know, w w one of the reasons why, you know, a, a lot of the countries here, and Burton is going to love this because he loves the post-Soviet bloc as well, is that, you know, one of the few things Soviets did do well is that they have taught us a very good sort of technical background and coding, and mathematics, and I think part of that heritage we still have, uh, which is part of the reason why we produce sort of raw technical talent, but I'm going to describe some of the issues of how to take that raw technical talent and actually build successful businesses out of that, which is sort of one of the biggest bottlenecks. But not to get ahead of ourselves, I want to compare to you a little bit the Czechs versus the Slovaks. And, you know, when I deliver this presentation, or at least this bit, uh, in, uh, in primarily Czech Republic, I always tell the Czechs that if I ever want the Czechs to feel good about themselves, I compare them to the Slovaks. And mind you, I'm Slovak, so I'm like a big patriot. I love Slovakia, but Czechs are simply doing better. And I know Pavel is laughing as the happy Czech in the crowd here. Uh, so this, uh, this slide is one of the few that I actually did steal from other speakers, and I just signed a paper that I was not supposed to steal anything. But this is from a dear friend of mine, Maciej Vtachnik, who presented here a couple of years ago. And these are the, the Slovak startup success stories he identified. So he came up with four companies. And I decided for the flavor to compare the Slovak success stories to the Czech ones and also break them down uh, based on different sort of tiers. So this is the biggest tier. Notice we do not have a 1 billion plus tier. We have a 100 million dollar plus tier. That's our biggest tier. And uh, the companies, you know, on the left side, you have Slovakia. Yeah, you have it on the left side. And this asset, it's like our giant antivirus company valued probably between three to five billion dollars. Uh, very successful, but pretty lonely uh, in, in, in that category. And then you have Czech Republic where you have AVG, which I told you about. It ended up being bought by Avas for 1.5 billion dollars a couple years ago, which makes Avas now valued at around five billion dollars. Then you have the represent guys, which is a hundred million dollar transaction. And then you have RSJ, Cessna and Sistinet. And notice that Czech Republic is twice as big as Slovakia, but notice the, how disproportionate the number of success stories in each of these categories are going to be as I go down them. Second one uh, is the tier between 10 and $100 million successes. And now here I had a pretty hard time, uh, especially about Slovakia, because MDOT, actually, you have the founder of MDOT, Pavel, here with me, and he'll be speaking shortly. And, you know, I didn't want to leave the Slovak category blank, so I hope Pavel, as a Czech, will excuse me, but I put them in the Slovak section to make the Slovaks feel better. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right, you do have a, a Slovak co-founder. Uh, so let's call it the Slovak success story. Uh, and then from the Czech Republic, you have two of our portfolio companies, that's Cognitive Security sold to Cisco, API sold to Oracle, and then two additional companies all sold between 10 to $100 million. And then the last, perhaps the most interesting category are startups that are currently or have raised significant funding or, or, or are growing and could be on par to get to at least a $100 million valuation. And in Slovakia, I, I take Matej's uh, logo, so you know, feel free to disagree with me, but it's Pixel Federation, which is a representative of a very strong historic category in Slovakia and the Czech Republic, which is gaming. Sajik, which are offline maps, uh, kind of like Google Maps, but offline. For those of you that object that Google also works offline, I don't know, but Sajik still works, and apparently they're doing well. And Piano is the biggest uh, paywall provider for online media in the world. So you sort of three startups that raised, let's say, somewhere around $10 million or are valued hopefully close to 100. But in the Czech Republic, you have like a whole host, a generation of startups coming out there doing really well. So Kiwi, um, 
online travel aggregator, over a billion dollars in turnover, Prusa Research, uh, the second biggest 3D printer manufacturer in the world, Good Data, raised over $100 million, big business intelligence company, Social Bakers, $40 million, and just a bunch of others. Simply, Czechs are doing pretty well, at least compared to the Slovaks. But not to keep the Czechs too happy, uh, you know, I compared the number of exits and their value uh, from Czechs and Israelis. And uh, you know, when I try to make the, the, the scale of the snowball uh, uh, proportionate to the size of the exits, actually the Israeli snowball came out of the slide. So I, I, I apologize, but I just couldn't fig fit it in because the Czech exits are so small. Uh, in Israel, in 2014, uh, startups were exit, the total value of startups exited there was $15 billion, whereas the Czech Republic didn't surpass a billion. So they just to give uh, Czechs a little bit of a cold shower as well. Uh, however, uh, coming back to the happy slides, uh, when you look at the European ecosystem as such, what you see behind me is the, a very positive trend since 2012 as to how many startups were funded, how much money is going into them, uh, and just in general how many deals at different stages get done. Uh, as you can see, all is pointing up and to the right, uh, so you know it's good news, but Central Europe is doing even better. Uh, when you look at the graph behind me, uh, when we started in 2010, there were 67 deals done. I mean, honestly, I don't know where those came from because we only saw 300 business plans this year, that year. Uh, but by 2016, that grew to like 240, uh, which is a Kager compounded annual growth rate of 20% uh, compared to six in Europe uh, or six in USA. So while we do start at small numbers, uh, slowly we are catching up uh, to some of the bigger guys as well. Um, and yeah, so much for the sort of happy stuff and the, and the good news and the success stories. And now I want to segue into, since we have already talked about the raw technical talent, which is our advantage, apparently a lot of money is flowing into the ecosystem at an increasing pace as well. What is the thing that is holding us back? And this is another slide that Burton hates. Like he, he told me like, this is a waste of time. Everybody in this class already knows the five ways how to build a $100 million business, which is great news. I don't have to spend much time on it, but it's a very useful framework for identifying the biggest bottlenecks uh, of our region. So just very briefly, because you all already know the slide. Also, this is another slide that I stole from a blog post online, not my own. Uh, when you look at the y-axis, it says average revenue per account. Uh, so that's in dollars. Uh, so basically, when you look at an elephant, which is sort of the highest on the y-axis, uh, it's basically a Fortune 500 company that is willing to pay for your product about $100,000 or more per year. On the x-axis, what you have is number of customers in uh, thousands. So, you know, the equation of how to get $100 million out of this is pretty easy. If you're selling something for $100,000 a year, you only need 1,000 Fortune 500 companies, which is pretty tough to do because there are only 500 of them, uh, to build a $100 million business. When you look at the complete opposite spectrum, the flies, there's the end uh, customers or users like you or me, where we don't actually pay for anything, but platforms like yeah. YouTube or Facebook monetize on top of us by advertising. And you need 10 million active users that will get you 10 bucks a year in advertisements to get to a $100 million business. And then the deer, that's a medium-sized business. Rabbit is a small entrepreneur. Uh, and the mouse is a pro user or pro consumer who pays like 10 bucks for something a month, like think like Dropbox, professional package or something. And when you look at our, so where it gets much more interesting is when you look at the Y axis as a sophistication of product and X axis as a sophistication of go to market strategy. So if you have a product that you are able to sell for $100,000 or more, to a Fortune 500 company, your go-to-market strategy is actually pretty easy relative to the other categories. Because all you have to do at such a high price point is hire polished sales guys who are going to go to speak to the Fortune 500 companies and push the product on top of them to, uh, for them to buy it. Um, and then the more down you go, the lower your price point per customer, the trickier your go-to-market strategy is because the lower your cost of acquisition can be, as simple as that. And where I try to illustrate the point of the biggest bottleneck of our region is we are a pretty immature ecosystem. When you look at the number of startups that have surpassed $100 million in valuation, you probably counted less than 10. 
We, but we have very strong technical talent. So what does that mean? That means that most of the companies, about 80% of companies that we see and invest in are hunting elephants. Why? Because we have very good IT guys who are able to build superior products, but we have no company builders that could take you know, an easier to build product, uh, but market it really well. Like for example, I don't know, the Spotify guys have done in Sweden. That's why today, 80% uh, of our deal flow comes from very heavy IT people and we help these technologies sort of bring, bring them to life and work with them to hire a sales force internationally, primarily in the US, to go after the big corporate customers here. And this is also the reason why out of the six exits that you have seen in one of the first slides, three of the largest ones were to Oracle, Cisco, and Customing. Uh, because when guys like Oracle and Cisco look at our companies and they're like, wow, this is great product, but why would I pay $3 million per year as a customer for it if I can just give you 50 and buy the company? And if you're a first time entrepreneur coming from Central and Eastern Europe, 50 million bucks sounds like a pretty good deal to you. So, the, so a lot of entrepreneurs would take such a deal. Um, the problem which it creates is that if we sell the companies too early, we are not necessarily contributing to the snowball ecosystem or the snowball effect of the startup ecosystem. Meaning you get people exiting the company so early that they do not necessarily acquire the company building experience of how to scale a company from zero to in revenue to tens of millions or 100,000, 100 millions in revenue or eventually IPO. Meaning that a lot less know-how gets back into the ecosystem and therefore the bottleneck of company builders remains in the ecosystem. That's sort of the central biggest hurdle of what Central European ecosystem is facing right now. We do not have enough skilled company builders that would take the technology, take the raw IT talent and transfer it into billion dollar companies. Uh, it is something that is slowly getting rolling. Like when you look at our exit of APR to Oracle, the first two employees or the founders were first two employees of Good Data, the big business intelligence company I told you about. The guys that represent had a previous company with which they went through Y Combinator and they exited and then started represent. So very few of them are these random stars coming out of nowhere with no previous uh, background in company building and just making it big. It does happen. For example, UiPath is a great example of how that, that is happening big time. Uh, but they are very rare and they come very far between. Um, just keeping an eye on the time. I don't want to bore you too much with the snowballs. So now we have sort of walked through the biggest opportunities, strengths, and also the weaknesses of the region. The raw talent, uh, the nice pictures of Prague, and uh, you know the livability of Central Europe. Uh, at the same time, the biggest challenge, which is, OK, we don't have enough company builders. What are we going to do about it? And that's where the funding players, hopefully, at least can partially supplement it. So when you look at our funding ecosystem today, uh, I would divide them into five different categories. Who invests in Central European startups? Uh, again, on the uh, y-axis, you are going to have the level of involvement of these different groups in Central Europe. On the x-axis, you are going to have experience with venture <coughs> capital. So obviously, the most experienced of the bunch are the blue chip VCs in London and San Francisco. However, they are also the most detached from the region. Uh, you know, they have plenty of deal flow in San Francisco or London or where wherever. So why would they have a direct presence in Central Europe today? So who else picks up the slack if not these guys who, by the way, then serve as perfect follow on investors for Series B and beyond once those companies get scaling? A, it's uh, public money managers. So there are a lot of government and EU initiatives all across Central Europe today that have a mandate to support ecosystem, the entrepreneurial ecosystem on, in one way or another um, within Central Europe. Typically, they are focused on one country or even a specific region of that country, but they do deploy the most money out of any entity today in Central Europe. Uh, then you would have other first-time local VCs that then managed to raise some external money. So it's sort of like our first fund back in 2010. Uh, so managing about 20 million euros, again, fairly local funds uh, trying to help their individual countries or ecosystems uh, grow out. Then you have 
perhaps the biggest weakness in the funding ecosystem today, and that's high net worth individuals and angels. And this is where the specificity of Central European region plays against us. Because as you know, we lived for 40 years under socialism when none of us could own anything. Everything was owned collectively. So you had a generation of entrepreneurs uh, transitioning from the 80s to the 90s where their primary motivation was to own everything and not share with, with anybody. Meaning that you, know, you have sort of a natural trade-off when it comes to company building between maximizing control and maximizing value of the company. And a lot of the entrepreneurs in Central Europe in the 90s were the ones who are trying to maximize or wanted to maximize control, even if it came in the conflict, in, with the conflict of maximizing value, because they primarily just wanted to own something and they didn't want anybody else to tell them what to do. Uh, so they didn't share any equity with employees, they didn't want to share it with investors. And the problem with this generation of entrepreneurs becoming angels uh, and, and making angel investing in you know, 21st century startups that are trying to copy the Anglo-Saxon model of investing is that they try to exercise the same amount of control and sort of the 90s culture uh, in, in the startups in, uh, in Central Europe where many times this leads to disputes with founders, the angels trying to take over the company or them taking disproportionate amount of stake in the company. And you know, sometimes this even results in sort of to totally killing the startup uh, in Central Europe. So the one player that has picked up the slack from that are the regional accelerators. So by today, you typically have one, two or three accelerators in every country in Central Europe, which is trying to bring together high net worth individuals and educate them how to behave with startups, how to invest, they create you know, classes, you know, programs where they try to educate uh, the angel investors on what are the do's and the don'ts of angel investing in Central Europe and are primarily responsible today for, for growing the next generation of angels which hopefully uh, will invest uh, more and more in Central Europe. And you can see that uh, you know, there's this top right corner uh, pretty empty and that's because I have taken these from our fundraising presentation for our next fund. So of course I had to re reserve that white space uh, for Credo, uh, as any good startup would. Uh, and what I'm trying to say here, that we are trying to be like the Western VCs from London or San Francisco, but having the local presence uh, in Central Europe. So at least we are trying to pretend that we really know what we are doing. Uh, we try to act uh, on top of the entire region of the eight countries, meaning that we are able to cherry pick the best, uh, best startups from each of those countries uh, and hopefully help them become successful on a global scale. But at the end of the day, uh, I will share with you one more data point about some research I have done a couple of years ago, which was the biggest factor in, uh, success factor in successful investments in Central Europe. And then has been uh, a category called better be lucky than smart. Uh, you know, just like with entrepreneurship, uh, you can use a lot of fancy word and have very fancy branding, but at the end of the day, it really depends on which startups you pick and how good those startups are gonna be. So all I can wish for our ecosystem in general is just uh, more luck and hopefully with luck will come more company builders where so they will help us build the next generation of successful startups. Thank you. Thanks, Andre. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take a couple questions now with Andre, and then we're going to bring up Pavel and Barbara for our panel session. Uh, questions? Yes. Hi. Nick. You Hi. mentioned uh, one of your differentiation from blue chip VCs in London and San Francisco is the locality to the region. So if uh, Sequoia or Andreessen were to open a local office there and leverage the power of the network and experience locally, how would you compete that? Yeah, so actually the reason why the presence is important is that you have to build out the local network. So, you know, if Sequoia would come in and spend the decade in, in the ecosystem or if you'd have hired really local individuals, it probably could have done the same. Uh, probably would have done better thanks to the branding. Uh, but the point being, if you are a billion dollar fund with a certain uh, capital structure, is it really effective for you to go after an ecosystem of the size I just described in Central Europe? Whereas if you are managing 70 million euros, obviously your motivation and your underlying economics uh, allow you to go much deeper even into a smaller ecosystem. 
So if they were to build out the presence, they would probably hire one really expensive guy who would try to cover the region. How successful would it be? I don't know. But my pitch, and the reason why I'm here, is to pitch to Sequoia that you, know, you don't have to open a presence there. Just talk to me, and I will show you the best startups already. Right. So, and actually, that comes back to the slide Burton hates. Uh, so, I'm sorry to bring it back up. Uh, but it, you know, the advice in general is go to where your customers are. And because 80% of the startups that we see and that come out of Central Europe are hunting for elephants, and because Fortune 500 companies are typically based here, well, it's that they are based here and they are also used to acquire technology or buy technology from here. So, you know, even Burton said that. And, and, and we have this joke with, with the CEO of Good Data who says, it's easier to meet the CIO of Morgan Stanley than of Commerzni Banka, which is like some Czech bank. And the point being that even a lot of European companies actually have their technology scouts here. So as counterintuitive as it sounds, even a lot of European deals just get done here because a lot of the corporations today are set up in a way where a lot of their technical budget gets spent here. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you know, I, I would answer that probably with the snowball in a sense that you sort of in the short run have to take uh, with what's there. And somehow, so, so you balance of what is there today and where you would like to move in the next 10 years. And obviously our ambition is to also build the next Spotify. Because if you look at you know, a lot of companies out there, uh, much higher multiples are applied typically to B2C companies as there are B2B enterprise level companies. It's just a lot sexier to be a B2C business. Uh, so in general, you know, that's why Skype is always, is always going to be a better motivator for a Central European or Eastern European ecosystem than a UiPath or a Cognitive Security. Because nobody knows what a UiPath or a Cognitive Security does. Everybody knows what Skype or Spotify does. So it's very important for us uh, if we really want to get the ball rolling, uh, to have some B2C successes as well, because those are really the household names that everybody recognizes, and then you can say, oh, you, you came up with Skype or whatever. So yes, we are trying to come up with ways how to help entrepreneurs think about building a B2C business out of uh, Central Europe as well, but it's very, very hard. Like when you, when you look at the seed and series A stage in Central Europe, it typically takes a lot longer on average to progress through those two stages than it would for a US startup. Because a founder from Central Europe has a longer learning curve, hopefully also at a steeper rate, to go through. Because not only do you have to go through all of the new essences of building the company for the first time, you also have to learn the Anglo-Saxon culture. And that is much harder with the end customer than it is to go after the Cisco's and Oracle's and you know, just talk to a couple of big guys and see what's what. Um, that's why it's taking longer, but definitely on our radar for the next five to 10 years. And just to follow up, does it have to do anything with, you know, you said that Prague is kind of like Eastern European budget on a, like a Western European style. Does it have to do with like income streams slightly lower in the region and Poland and Bulgaria in particular, that there's like less money for the $10 a month model? No, it's not even that. It's just that the markets are fragmented. So for a Polish company, and I'm going to exaggerate here, it's equally as difficult to penetrate a Czech market than it is an American market. Because the culture is different. And maybe between those two countries is different, but let's say Poland and Croatia. Uh, the markets are totally different. Uh, the users are different. The design of the product would be different. The branding would be different. So why bother, right? Why, why go to such a small country if you might as well try your luck with the big one? Uh, so that's what we are trying to encourage our startups to do. So it's, you know, on the contrary, so we are like trying to pitch to a lot of, and part of the mission why I'm here, pitch to interesting US execs and company builders to actually try living in Prague because we think that it is an interesting city to live in. And at the same time, they can have a much bigger impact on an ecosystem than they would if they were here. So it's sort of part of a sales pitch we are trying to make work here. Uh, we're going to bring... Andre back up as part of the panel. Thank you, Andre. <clears throat> Thank you.